Dr. Rodiger's research has had a tremendous impact on the field of cognitive psychology and beyond. According to the Institute of Scientific uh, Information, Dr. Rodiger's papers um, had the greatest impact in the field of psychology for the five year period from 1990 to 1994. That is, of all psychologists in the entire field, his papers <laughs> had the highest number of average citations. Um, and note that this did not include the now classic Rodiger and McDermott 1995 paper, which to date has more than 1,200 citations according to the Web of Science. In 2005, he was named uh, as one of the highly cited researchers in psychology and psychiatry, again, according to the scientific information list of highly cited researchers. Uh, Dr. Rodiger, um, sorry, I'm so nervous. It's so sort of nerve wracking to introduce my graduate mentor, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, Dr. Rodiger is uh, the president of the American Psychological Society, uh, now the Association for Psychological Science. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Psychological Association, and the American Psychological Society. Uh, 1994 to 1995, he held a Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, and he's also an elected member of the Society of Experimental Psychologists. Um, finally, I would be remiss without mentioning what an extraordinary mentor Dr. Rodiger is. Uh, as a grad student and has lab many years ago, I had some sense that I was very lucky to be a Rodiger student, uh, but now that I'm older and have greater perspective, I think I realize even more uh, profoundly uh, what a tremendous opportunity it really was to work with someone who was always supportive, always generous, and always very patient with his students. I can't imagine a better mentor. It is my great honor that you're here. I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, and I hope that you all join me in welcoming Dr. Roddy Rodiger. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. It's a uh, great honor to be here for this uh, speaker series, especially uh, the first day of classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's great to see Michelle and also Keith Hutchison, who uh, was a former Washington University person, too. So it's great, great to be here in Bozeman. When I told people I was coming to Bozeman, uh, so many people I have been here and really love the place. I had one person tell me I'm thinking of retiring there. I had a person in our philosophy department saying, boy, I'd love to. Uh, be there. I love to visit every chance I get. And uh, my wife and I were here a few days early to tour Yellowstone and Grand Teton Park. And the guidebook we bought uh, raved about Bozeman and how wonderful it was. So it's good to visit and to see old friends. And it wasn't that many years ago you were at Washington University. I like 10 maybe, but uh, it seemed short to me. Um, so thank you for coming today. Um, and. Let me, uh, before I begin my remarks, I've never been to Bozeman, I've also never spoken in something called a procrastinating <laughs> school. So I'm expecting people to come in 20, 30 minutes late. Uh, the, um, uh, one thing I do like to mention at the beginning of my talks is five years ago I had some surgery on my tongue and mouth. Uh, not something you want to have happen to you, but that's why my speech, in case you're wondering, is a little bit off. Uh, it's actually gotten better over time, but I've worked this into my introduction of my talks uh, because I was very self-conscious right after the surgery uh, and radiation therapy. So my speech is actually better than it was a few years ago, but still a little bit off. Um, so what I want to tell you about today is some research on a topic that Michelle didn't mention, which is actually something I've been doing the last five or six years now. And it is, uh, I spent my whole professional life studying learning and memory both things that make it work uh, better and things that create false memories, illusions of memory also, uh, reasons that we forget. Um, but uh, a few years ago, I decided to shift focus. Uh, I and uh, some of my colleagues I'll mention, uh, but particularly Mark McDaniel, Kathleen McDermott, um, received several grants to look at ways of trying to take what we know in the laboratory and move it into the classroom. If we know so much about learning and memory, or do we know so much about learning and memory, how come it hasn't had more of an impact uh, on educational practice? And of course, there is a huge field of educational psychology, and people have been doing work on that for many years, so it's not like we're inventing something new. But we tried to take a new 
tact on it that I'll talk about today. Um, and so, uh, one thing we can ask, um, well, what, I, what activities do students engage in when they learn? So, uh, we did a survey some years ago, we being uh, Jeff Garpicki and Andrew Butler and I. This is of Washington University undergraduates, but since this was published, there have been several other uh, surveys like this at other universities with basically the same result. And you ask them, you pose the question, well, you've got a test coming up in a week. Uh, what do you normally do to study for your test? How do you uh, do that? And here uh, are the strategies that are mentioned, not with equal frequency. Uh, in fact, the top two are the most highly mentioned strategies students say they use. They uh, read material and then they reread it. Uh, and they'll often highlight material in their books. In my days, they would un underline it, but in these days, uh, they often use highlighting pens. And you've often seen students' books, and maybe you even own some that have practically everything highlighted. Uh, and then they reread that. Some people say they review and rewrite their notes from class. A few people talk about deliberate strategies to memorize, but not many. Some people say for certain types of material, they might use flashcards. Uh, some people say they outline material. And some people talk about study groups, joining study groups. Uh, so that's uh, the main strategies people say they use. If we ask, well, how do we know if students are learning anything? Well, how do we measure learning? Well, we all know that too. Uh, we didn't ask them, because we all know. Uh, in universities and in first grade on, we give quizzes, we give tests, we give essays occasionally, uh, or we give final exams. Um, and uh, what I'm going to suggest today is that uh, whoops. Oh, oh, here it is. Um, that if we did more of these activities now at the bottom, we would actually do more to promote learning up here at the top. That actually giving quizzes and tests and exams uh, causes an activity that makes people remember material much more effectively, certainly more effectively than rereading it, which is what students normally do. Uh, so if students test themselves, or if their professors test them, they'll remember better. That's the punchline, and I'm going to tell you a much longer story about how we got there. Uh, the general idea behind this research is to take um, uh, lab research on simple materials and laboratory settings, the kind of stuff that's very, uh, seems educationally irrelevant, uh, but we're going to try to make it relevant. So we use we start with material uh, from simple procedures in the lab. We then try, if we find something we think is interesting, we try to scale it up to use more complex educational-like materials still in the lab, but can we make something that works with, say, lists of pictures or words? Uh, can we make it work with prose? Um, and then, assuming we can, then we can we really take it into the classroom? And I have one project uh, that I'll talk about at the end where this is exactly what we try to do. We try to do true experiments in the classroom, in the middle school classroom in our case. Um, and then also we observe and talk to the students and the teachers in the classroom and we get, uh, we're not proud, we get ideas for future research uh, and then we start over again, trying to take those ideas and say, can we make them work? Can we then, uh, so I'm going to tell you just about what iteration of this cycle, what we're trying to do. Um, the really hard part, as you might guess, is this uh, arrow over here where you're trying to take the materials into the classroom. Uh, I could tell you, I could give a whole lecture just on the problems of doing that, um, but I'll save that. So uh, the assumption in education, of course, is that activities, um, if we go backwards to here, these activities at the top are how people learn. The activities at the bottom are, are simply measurement of learning. And the assumption that we've had in education, uh, especially higher education, actually, especially at the university level, is that uh, tests and quizzes, they function kind of like a dipstick. You put it into the student's head, and you measure how much knowledge they have. And you take it out, and you look at it, and record it. So quizzes are used for, uh, or tests or essays or exams are used for what's called summative assessment to, in order to give grades but they really don't affect learning itself. And in fact, in the, the 
people have been studying learning and memory in laboratory situations for over 125 years now, and that's exactly the same assumption that's built in. If you ever had a course in human learning and memory as an undergraduate, that was the assumption, that you give people stuff to study, you test them, see how much they learn, they study it again, they learn more, you test them again, they show more learning, and so forth. So uh, the idea is that um, study episodes are what creates learning, and test episodes are relatively neutral. Uh, that's been the assumption of psychology, certainly when I came into the field. Uh, and what I'll be questioning today is whether tests merely measure learning or whether they also change it, whether they also, uh, as we'll see today, improve it. So just to give you one example, uh, if you have had the good fortune never to be in a learning and memory experiment, uh, the, uh, here's, a very, here's one of the simplest kinds of experiments you can do that produces very beautiful regular results. So you give people something simple to remember, say words in a list, you ask them, give them a blank sheet of paper after they, say, heard the words once or seen the words once. Ask them to recall the words in any order. That's called free recall, because you're free to recall them in any order. And then you simply repeat the procedure. So this is what's called the steady test paradigm. And if you do this over and over with the same material, maybe presented in a new random order every time, uh, what you get is a learning curve that looks like this. This is the classic learning curve. This is I just picked one that was handy. This is one from an experiment that uh, a man named Mendel Tobing did in 1962. But I could have picked any one of uh, hundreds of these kind of learning curves. And they all have this pretty logarithmic shape. Uh, so at first, people learn very rapidly, and then they hit diminishing returns. In this case, there are only 16 words. So of course, they have to hit diminishing returns. Uh, but even if you make the list really long, people still seem to ask them to way before they get to the top of the list. And so again, the assumption is that when people study the words, they're learning, when they're tested on them, uh, they're simply expressing the knowledge they gained on the previous study trials. Uh, and one of my own uh, personal uh, awakenings to this not being quite the whole story was 20 years ago in a paper that Mark Wheeler, or a set of experiments Mark Wheeler and I did for a totally different purpose. I'm not going to tell you the purpose of the experiments I'm telling you kind of a sideline of them. Uh, we actually vary other things than what I'm telling you here. But in this particular experiment, people saw 60 pictures, and the pictures were embedded in a story. So they're actually listening to a story, and whenever, you know, so if there was an alligator in the story, which there was, uh, the uh, picture of an alligator popped up at the right time when it was first mentioned in the story, just the first time it was mentioned. So there were 60 pictures embedded in a story, and, and people just heard the story once and saw the pictures once. And then afterwards, they were either excused and told to go home and come back a week later. Uh, or they took one recall test. They tried to recall as many pictures as they could, the names of the pictures. So if they uh, heard the word alligator and saw an alligator, they were, didn't, weren't asked to recall the whole story, just the 60 pictures, or as many of them as they could. And they did that one time for one group of people. And the other group of people were called at one time, and then we took away their sheets, gave them a separate sheet, again, just free recall Recall as many pictures in any order as you want. They did it a second time, and then they did it a third time. We told them to try to improve each time, and actually they did improve slightly. Um, but the real interest for today's talk is not what happened this first week. So they studied, everybody studied the same 60 pictures, took zero, one, or three tests, we brought them back a week later and gave them a delayed test. Asked how many of the 60 pictures can you remember now a week later? Um, and here are the results a week later. The people who simply studied the pictures and heard the stories got a bit over 16. The people who got one test got a bit over 24. And the people who got uh, three tests the first week recalled about 33. So they didn't quite double recall, but uh, almost. Uh, so everybody had the same study experiences. The only thing that differed was their practice in retrieving the material the week before. So if they practiced it three times, they did better a week later than if they practiced it only once. And if they didn't practice it at least once, they didn't remember it very well at all. They got only 16 or 17 out of the 60 pictures. So here, simply varying the number of tests uh, produced this huge effect on recall. 
and I went back in the literature, and of course people had discovered this before we had, um, but we got particularly large effects. Now, if you're sitting there with a skeptical mood at your seat, as many psychologists don't want to do, uh, you could say, well, this really doesn't show testing matters per se, because after all, when people recall the material, they're writing it down, so they have the chance to restudy it. So really, you've kind of confounded studying and testing, because maybe what you're calling this testing effect, the fact that giving three tests at the first week is better than uh, one test is better than no test, maybe that's just due to subjects re-exposing themselves, the students in the experiment, re-exposing themselves to material. Uh, this is a common criticism of this kind of work. Um, so uh, many uh, the first experiment I can find, I mean, I can't swear John Locke didn't do this or something, but uh, at least uh, a woman named Edwina Abbott first published an experiment kind of like this uh, in 1909. And, and as I say, the common objection to this is maybe all testing does is to re-expose students to material so the effect might be due simply to repetition, just like rereading it. Um, and so we wanted to ask, is this true? And I've asked this question now and satisfied myself it's not true, but let me tell you one of the experiments I find the most compelling to convince myself of this. And it's one uh, graduate student uh, named Franklin Jerome and I uh, did and published uh, a couple of years ago now. Um, and here's what we did. We simply, uh, this, we, these are, we switched to uh, 50 word lists. These were words belonging to common categories, so some types of animals, some types of furniture, so forth. Uh, and they got a 50 word list. Um, and they had eight either study or test trials. Again, pre-recall tests. Uh, and they were given a final test two days after what I'm going to tell you happened. This, what I have pictured here all happened on day one. So this first condition is simply the standard study test, study test. So you study 50 words, recall as many as you can, study them again in a different random order, recall them again, and so forth. Um, and then in the second condition, what we did was we dropped out two test trials, this one and this one, and replaced them with study trials. Because um, on these test trials, remember, if, if all testing does is to re-expose people to things they've studied, uh, they're not recalling very much. If we replace a test trial with a study trial, that should really help them if it's simple re-exposure. And finally, we did the obvious thing. We just presented with little breaks in between. We just presented the list uh, eight times uh, in the same pacing as the study test. So we slowed the presentation rate down. Uh, so the whole experiment, all three conditions, took the same amount of time. Um, and uh, so if you look here, uh, we can plot the data two ways. One is plotting number of study trials. So here we go from four to six to eight study trials. Uh, and number of study times is an old variable. As you might guess, it has a positive effect usually. And so we first looked at our data, or one way to look at our data uh, is to ask, if we just plot things as a function of number of study trials, how do the data look? And strangely, in our experiment, they look like this. If you study things four times, you remember 39%. If you study things eight times, you remember 17%. <laughs> so the exact opposite of what everybody in their right mind would think. Um, but if you look back to the way we did the experiment, usually number of study periods are uh, manipulated a different way because we deliberately confounded number of study trials, four, six, and eight, with number of test trials, zero, two, and four. Um, and so um, all we have to do is go back to make sense of these data, at least by my lights. We go back and we simply plot the same data. All I'm doing is reordering the columns now as a function of number of prior tests. And you can see what really matters two days later for recall is not the number of times people studied the material, um, that was, well, we don't know because we confounded the variables, but the number of prior tests is what really seemed, just like in the Wheeler and Voter experiment I talked about, uh, with no tests, even though people have studied them eight times, with no tests, 
they only recall 17% two days later. If they'd studied them four times, but taken four tests, they did more than twice as well. So it can't be that it's just the number of times you study something that matters. Uh, testing does more than just let people re-expose themselves to the information. So here, again, just to go back to the basic design, if I now give you this information, so when you restudy everything, you know, obviously you get all 50 words every time. Uh, when their tests inserted, now they only got 17 or 16 on the first test, 26 on the second test here. Notice that even after three more studies, they're still only getting 26 here. So the same, despite four studies here, only two there, they're still getting 26. Um, then they got 28, then 32. Uh, so if you just total all those up, you see if, uh, if you give people credit, I'm rounding off obviously, but if you give people credit every time they recall an item is re-exposing it to themselves, we see there are 400 exposures here, only 300 there, and yet remember, recall is twice as good here in this condition as it was there. Back to the previous slide. Uh, that was that last condition, 300 presentations here, um, uh, 400 there. So there's something about the act of retrieval that makes something much more memorable than simply studying it again. That's called the retrieval practice or testing effect. Um, whoops, I'm going the wrong way, all right. And William James actually knew this. In his great book, Principles of Psychology, he wrote uh, this wonderful passage. Uh, a curious peculiarity of our memory is that things are impressed better by the active than passive repetition. I mean that in learning by heart, for example, when we almost know the piece, uh, say learning poetry was what he was mainly concerned with, it pays better to wait and recollect by an effort from within, trying to do it yourself, uh, than to look at the book again. If we recover the words in the former way, we shall probably know them the next time. If in the latter way, we shall very likely need the book once more. So if you just repeatedly study things, remember that's what Washington University say is their most common study strategy. They repeatedly read things. Uh, if they do things that way, they're much more likely to be forgotten than if you use an active retrieval strategy. If you test yourself and you make yourself retrieve. So as I say, this is called the testing effect or the retrieval practice effect. And so testing of memory, unlike what we usually think of in education and in psychology experiments, not only assesses what we know, but in the process of assessing the knowledge, we also change it. And we make it more durable, uh, less likely to be forgotten later on. Um, and so retrieval practice enhances retention. Jeff Karpicki pictured here, another graduate student, uh, at Washington University with me, who's now at Purdue University. Uh, we wrote a big long review paper, if you're interested in this, there's more information than you probably want to know, but nonetheless, there it is. Um, uh, reviewing what had been done, uh, and, and I'll now try to be telling you about studies we've done mostly since this review came out that tries to elucidate the effects to some extent. Um, one thing we're interested in, when you tell people, you know, the standard way psychologists study learning and memory, the study, test, study, test, study, test procedure, uh, everybody says, quite correctly, this is really cumbersome. Why on earth? Uh, imagine if you uh, have flashcards. Uh, my daughter's a third year medical student, or second year, they have to memorize all this stuff. And they, if you go to a medical school bookstore somewhere, they just have flashcards uh, galore that there's ones from the nervous system, the muscular system, the skeletal system. Uh, they test themselves all the time. Um, uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, but nobody does it using the standard test study test procedure. If you read the instructions in every flashcard manual I've ever looked at, it tells you to use a dropout procedure, which sounds much better. And it is, in a way, much better. So the dropout procedure is you test yourself until you know something, uh, but once you know it, once you can retrieve it, then you know it, you should drop that out and concentrate on the stuff you don't know. And that's the way every manual works, it's the way all students work. And so, and people have studied that, and I'll show you, uh, we added a new wrinkle to these studies, we being Jeff Karpicki again, uh, and I. And, and uh, I keep talking when I should be pushing buttons here. 
anyway, uh, the, 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 we tested the idea that it will really help you to drop things you already know and only concentrate on the stuff you don't know, uh, which sounds like perfectly sensible advice. And it's probably the way you've used flashcards. And up to a point, it's true, but I'll show you a point of it that isn't true. Um, so what we did was simply <coughs> compare two procedures, the standard study everything, test on everything, study everything, test on everything. Uh, we used 48, 40 words rather, uh, eight trials, standard test, uh, and we compared this with a dropout procedure. Uh, in this case, this is again, if you recall, we had people study the words, all 40, and let's say they recall seven. Uh, then we'd say, okay, they know those seven, uh, we would drop them out of what they studied the next time. So next time they would study the 33 they haven't gotten, and then they would recall as many of those as they could, Let's say they recall five more, we then drop them out, then they would study 28 and so forth. Uh, by the way, between study and test, there was a 30 second distractor period where they had to do arithmetic, so they couldn't just sit there and hold them in short term memory and spew them out. They had to uh, hold them in face of distraction for 30 seconds before they recalled them. And so we're interested, well, what would the learning curve look like uh, for the dropout condition and for the uh, standard condition? And the answer is the dropout condition is much more efficient. Other people had showed this before us. Uh, so you see the dropout condition, they get to 100%. Eventually they recall all the words. In the standard condition, despite hearing them much more, uh, many more times, they never quite get there. Uh, we would have to give them many more trials to do that. So that's why everybody uses the dropout condition, right? It's more efficient. You get more bang for the buck. Uh, but what we did that nobody had done before was ask the people to come back 48 hours later and see what they knew. And when we did that, we found out the standard condition was much better than the dropout condition. Uh, and if you look at forgetting, you could say, well, forgetting, uh, they went from 100% down, almost 100% down to 21%. And even despite the ceiling effect in the proportion recalled with, on the left here, whoops, didn't help to me. Despite the fact that they got to be perfect, they still forgot. They went from almost 100% down to 20%, whereas the standard condition, kind of like the tortoise and the tortoise and the hare race, they were slow but steady, but then they hung on better to the information. Now they lost 44%, uh, or I'm sorry, 43% going to the 78%. So one problem with the dropout condition is that, yes, it creates fast learning, but it also creates fast forgetting. People don't retain, even over 48 hours, they don't retain the information better. And we've also done this kind of experiment with uh, foreign language vocabulary that I'll get to shortly. Uh, so uh, the dropout condition seems to be uh, very effective, but um, it is if you only look at learning curves, but if you ask what do people know later, which frankly we hardly ever ask in education, uh, we're so focused on immediate tests, uh, then you see it actually boomerangs. Uh, and Robert Bjork uh, has coined a name for this pattern of results that I just showed you. He refers to a concept called desirable difficulties. And the idea uh, is that sometimes conditions that make learning slower are actually more effective than conditions that make learning faster. And so, uh, something about the standard technique that we talked about, um, something about the standard condition, although it makes learning slower, it makes it better in the long term. Recall it's twice as good a week later after the standard condition than after the dropout condition. So this is exactly the pattern of results. And, and there are other things that cause this, I mean, we weren't coined this concept before we ever did this experiment. So he wasn't talking about uh, this kind of experiment when he did it. Uh, but it's a pattern psychologists see in their data enough to make you worry because often educational techniques are based on what creates good immediate learning. And if what creates good immediate learning is uncorrelated or even negatively <coughs> correlated with what creates durable, long-lasting learning, then we're in trouble. And so to the extent that we can find factors that create durable learning, that should be what we're uh, presumably after. Um, so uh, there's something about the standard condition that's better than the dropout condition. And we can ask ourselves, what? 
if you think about it, there are two obvious possibilities. And when we started out to do this experiment, I was sure both of them were true. Uh, so if you think, so the dropout condition, as soon as you recall something, so if you see a picture of an umbrella and you recall an umbrella, it drops out. It's not studied again and it's not tested again. So it could be all those repeated study events that you're missing in the dropout condition. That could affect your attention two days later. And it could be, remember the uh, dropout condition, you only recall something once and then it's dropped out. It could be all those repeated retrievals who are also, as I've already shown you, probably affecting learning. So Jeff Karpicki and I started out to do an experiment to ask, can we decide which is the relative power of studying and testing? Um, and we switched, uh, we had people learn uh, foreign language word pairs. We picked Swahili since practically nobody comes to Washington University knowing Swahili. And also when you write the words down, they look like perfectly good pronounceable English words. They don't look weird or something. So masculine means boat, leza means scarf, so forth. So we had people study the 40 pairs uh, and be tested on these pairs different numbers of times. And we had four conditions. This looks busy, and in fact it is busy, but let me walk you through it to try to make it easy. Because these are the two conditions we had last time in the previous experiment I just told you about. So here's the repeated study, uh, the study plus retrieval is really the study test condition. They studied all 40 words four times. They were tested on all 40 words four times. Study test, study test for all 40 pairs. Uh, here's the dropout condition. Once they recall the word, they never studied it again, and they were never tested on it again. And it just worked out in the experiment. We couldn't control this. It's under the subject's control. But they wound up studying about half as many times as in this condition, and they wound up retrieving about half as many times in this condition. Uh, and so we're expecting to replicate the earlier experiment uh, and show that this condition produced better long-term retention than this condition. But these two conditions in the middle are the ones we were especially interested in because they let us ask, which has the relative power here? Is it studying or is it retrieving? So in a repeated retrieval condition, just like this one, they studied all the words 40 times, but once they recall the word, we never tested them on it again. So they got the word once, they saw Laza and they got the scarf, and then we dropped it out from the test trials, but not from the study trials. So they kept studying Laza scarf, but they were never tested again. And again, it wound up being about half as many trials as for this condition. But they still studied as much. For the repeated retrieval group, this is the fourth group of people, we did the exact opposite. Now, as soon as they recalled it, they never studied it again. If they recalled Laza scarf, they never studied it again in the experiment, but we kept testing them on it. Uh, so they get Laza, they have to produce scarf themselves. If they missed it, too bad, we didn't give it to them. There was no feedback but they usually didn't miss it. They almost always, once they got it right, they kept maintaining it. So we didn't have that big problem. But now you can see what we're trying to do. We're going to ask uh, two weeks later, which of these conditions is superior? They've all had about the same total number of study and test trials, but the, the ordering differs. These group, this group got lots of repeated study trials. This group got lots of repeated test trials. Uh, and here are the results. Uh, the test in this case was a week later. We brought the, all four groups back and tested their memory for the 40 pairs again. Now what I'll show you next is the probability of recall. Um, and the story here is disarmingly simple, in fact, shockingly simple. And that is, after a week, repeated retrieval is what really matters, and repeated study doesn't matter much, or, or at all. So here, in, this, in the drop condition, uh, they had 78 study and 78 tests. Here they had uh, 160 study and about 80 tests. And you see there's only a 3, 4% difference, not statistically significant. So despite all this massive amount of extra study, a week later it didn't matter. But if we go over here and look at the uh, study plus retrieval and repeated retrieval, this group has many fewer study trials than this group but again, recall doesn't matter, doesn't differ much as a function of how many times people send you the information. Uh, but it, um, 
uh, and notice the total number of study and or test events is about equated for these two groups. This group had lots more retrieval events, this group had lots more study events, but the retrieval events is what really created superior long-term retention. So the reason the dropout method doesn't work so well uh, is not that you're not depriving yourself of study, it's that you're depriving yourself of repeated testing, of retrieving it repeatedly helps to consolidate the memory and make it long-lasting. Uh, so we were very surprised at this, actually, because I was sure, I mean, I thought repeated retrieval was better than retrieval, repeated studying, but I thought studying must have some effect, and in some experiments it does, but with these paired associate foreign language items, uh, repeated retrieval is really what matters. And Jeff Karpicki's dissertation was on this, too, asking questions like, if you put dropping things out under subjects control, students control, if you tell them, drop it when you're absolutely sure you know it, they always drop it after a time or two. They never test themselves as much as they think they should. And this is a way counterintuitive, because one part of education is, one idea that's very influential in education is, let's put education in the students' hands. The students know what they know and don't know. Let them figure it out. So, uh, and what our studies show is, no, actually we know, better than the students know, how much they should practice retrieval. They'll stop way too soon. They think they really have something permanently when they only have it uh, temporarily. And I'll show you some more evidence on this in a, middle, in a minute. Uh, so, we showed this with very simple material, you know, lists of words, foreign language vocabulary, still pretty simple stuff. Uh, so then we asked, well, could we scale this up? Could we make these results work better? Um, now, I'm kind of telling the story a little bit out of order, but we're asking these questions roughly at the same time. Uh, so we did passages. Uh, we wanted to do these kinds of experiments with prose passages. And the passages we used were a number of different ones that were actually taken uh, from standardized tests. Um, and so we had some on science and some on social studies. One was on Louis Armstrong, one was on sea otters, just a whole variety of topics. And they were short, 250 word, plus or minus a few prose passages. And uh, we just did what you would expect, given what I've been telling you. We had one group study the passage four times um, with just little breaks in between. We told them there'd be a test later. We want you to keep studying. Uh, we also gave then another group studied the passage three times. They read the passage. Actually, let me back up. They were given four minutes to read the passage, because the passage was short. And we asked the students to make a mark every time they finished reading a passage, uh, so we could measure the number of times they really read the passage. Another time, they were given three study periods, and then a test. Just recall as much as you can from the passage, um, trying to recreate it. And they got about 70% when we asked them to do that. The third condition, uh, just one study and three tests. Uh, and so they only got one shot at it, and then they had to record from their own uh, minds three times. Again, just trying to recreate it as well as they could. Uh, and after that, we asked them, how well do you think you'll remember the passage in a week? Because that's when we're going to test you. Uh, so we're going to have a final test in a week. How well do you think you'll do? One being not very well, seven very well. Uh, and then sure enough, uh, some people, we ask everybody that question, but some people, we then actually tested them just after five minutes. We didn't wait a week. We gave them a final test after five minutes. But another half we excused, and they came back a week later. Um, so to show you first, how many times did people actually read the passage? Again, we gave them four minutes, but we knew that was more than enough time. And um, so if we just look at the number of times they read the passage, it was actually a huge difference. The group that was given four periods to read said, we actually got through it 14 times. The group that was given just one four minute period, they said, we read it about three times. So the number of studies of the passage is varied from three to 14. And then remember, after they finished this phase, they, asked, they were asked to make a, a rating. How well will you know this after a week? Uh, and here's how they predicted on the seven point scale. Um, the people uh, who read it four times, I mean, I mean, got four study periods, really read it 14 times, they were sick of it. They were relatively sure they would remember this sucker a week later because they just read it 14 times. The people who take a test 
said, whoa, this is a little bit harder than I thought. They were less confident. Uh, uh, and the people who'd always studied once and taken three tests, of course, were the least confident. Um, so how'd they do after a week? Well, we brought them back a week later, and here's how they did, the three groups. <laughs> exactly the opposite of the way they predicted they would do. The group that studied only one time, but practiced retrieving it three times, uh, recalled the most. The group that, as you can see, most of the effect though is really that first retrieval. The group that studied it three times and was tested once uh, did next best. The group that was so confident they could do well, they read the thing 14 times after all, uh, they did the worst. They got a little bit better than 40%. So performance went from a little over 40% to nearly 70%. So you get the, the picture that uh, performance is much worse uh, after repeated studying than after testing. So we were able to scale the findings up. Now, can we ask, well, are students just crazy? I mean, they have no idea what's going on. Well, they do. Because if you look at the group that I'm going to put up next, here's how they did after five minutes. They did exactly like they expected to do. If they read it 14 times, they remembered it better on the short term. This is what every student knows. It's called cramming. Uh, so if you cram, if you read something over and over and over again, right before the test, yeah, you do fine on the test. Just a week later, you're screwed. Uh, you drop from over 80% to 40%. Uh, whereas if you tested yourself, uh, it didn't help you immediately, but it showed good retention over the long term. Uh, so um, we got these kind of results in several other experiments using more realistic educational materials. And um, this gave us the hope uh, after a while to uh, scale things up and to try to move them into the classroom. Oh, first, uh, to quote William James again, he has a great uh, passage on cramming. Um, and he says, the reason why cramming is such a bad idea, or bad mode of study is now made clear. Now he didn't mean my experiment made it clear for him. He meant the two or three paragraphs he wrote before that made it clear for him, but for my purposes it works well. Things learned in a few hours on one occasion for one purpose cannot possibly have formed many associations with other things in the mind. Their brain processes are led by few paths are relatively little liable to be awakened again. Speedy oblivion is the almost inevitable fate of all that is committed to memory in this way. And if you look here, here's the uh, speedy oblivion of which James talked about. People did great right immediately, but even a week later they had dropped by a factor of uh, two. Uh, so yes, speedy oblivion compared to this other condition, uh, which um, and involved testing where they were able to retain the information better. So now there's this program which we used to call test enhanced learning. We're trying to get away from that term now because educators hate the whole concept of testing because it conjures up uh, standardized tests and teaching through the tests. And I, I'm not really talking about standardized tests. I'm talking about everyday quizzing in the classroom and students using self-quizzing as a study strategy. So this whole line of work is agnostic with regard to standardized testing, which probably, yes, is being used too much in the classroom. Uh, but quizzing can still be effective. But when we go around and talk to teachers about test enhanced learning, they uh, are mad at you before you ever open your mouth because you use the word test. So now we call it a retrieval enhanced learning, which seems to go over a little better. Uh, but the students in, um, we worked with a middle school classroom near St. Louis. It's actually in Columbia, Illinois, right across the river. Uh, and we worked with 6th and 7th and 8th grade science classes, also social study classes. Um, and we we're trying to go into the classroom and do true experiments with, I mean, we're not bringing in extra material and doing experiments in the classroom that way. We we're using the material the teacher assigns to the students, her books, uh, her real tests, uh, and trying to incorporate ourselves into the classroom and the way we do it is by giving little no-stakes quizzes. Just takes about five minutes of the class time. And we have a research assistant in there. The teacher leaves the class while our assistant's doing this quizzing. And what we do is she's identified, the teacher's identified concepts she really wants the students to know. And what we do is we uh, take these and uh, we randomly assign some items to be quizzed and other items to be control items and not quizzed. 
Uh, and we can use up to three little quizzes, sometimes one right before the material is presented, then right afterwards, and then one more review time later. And then they take uh, tests at the end of chapters, end of the semester, end of the year. These are tests on which the students, the final tests are the ones on which students are graded. So they care about these tests. They're not just ones we created for purposes of an experiment. Uh, the, my collaborators are here at the bottom, Mark Daniel, Kathleen McDermott, and a postdoctoral fellow named Pooja Agarwal. Um, and we've done a whole lot of these experiments now. I'm just going to talk about one to give you the flavor of how we do them. Um, so as I said, we use the textbook materials used by the teachers. We use multiple choice quizzes. We actually get more powerful effects with recall quizzes and recognition quizzes. Multiple choice is recognition. But recognition works usually fine too, not always, but it has for our purposes. So we, again, distinguish between quiz and quiz, non-quiz material, but each teacher at the middle school has six classrooms of the same subject. So across classes, we can have each item, if it's a fact about India and social studies, we can have that fact quiz for some students and not for others. Uh, so we can do a true experiment in the classroom and we also don't assign a whole class. That most educational research is to assign a whole classroom to one treatment and another classroom to a different treatment. Uh, so it's kind of a between classroom thing. We're not doing that. We're doing within student or within subject, within student designs. Every student serves as his or her own control with different sets of material. And then eventually we measure performance on chapter tests. And when possible, we try to get into the semester and into the year exams if we can get the teacher to insert our questions into her final exam or into her chapter, into the semester exam. So as I mentioned, this is a within students design. So we take the set of material and some of it's tested, some of it's not tested. And of course, there's a lot of material that we don't include in the experiment, which you can't include but so much. And we simply ask, uh, on the final criterial test is that the teacher gives a grade on is one type of material tested or produced better than the other uh, on the test. We often have a rereading control condition too, so the people, instead of getting tests, they just reread the material, uh, reread the, essentially the answer. All of these tests are with feedback, unlike the earlier ones we talked about, uh, but these tests are with feedback. So once they click an answer, uh, they have response, student response systems or clicker systems. They click in their answer, and then the correct answer comes up on the black or on the whiteboard. So here's what it looks like. They come in, they take a pre-quiz in this one experiment. Uh, before it's a four alternative, four choice test. They get 43 percent, meaning either they knew something about the topic, or more likely, the test is not completely, you know, for alternatives that are not equally likely. They can eliminate some just by uh, using reasoning. They then maybe do the reading. We can't control that, but they have the book. They're supposed to read it, we don't know. Uh, and then they hear the class lecture from the teacher about whatever the subject is. Uh, and then they take a post-test the day after the, the lecture. And now they've shot up to 91%. And they stay there on a review test, take it a couple of days later. Uh, for the non-quiz material, again, uh, it's treated identically. The teacher doesn't know what's quiz and what isn't quiz. Uh, she's out of the classroom when the quizzes are given, so she's just giving lectures about the other material. And again, remember, it's the same students. Uh, just some of the items are quiz, some are not. And it's different across the six classrooms. So it's a nightmare of counterbalancing and busy work for our research assistants. Uh, and when people ask me, how come there's not more educational research in the school? And I tell them, it's because it's really, really hard to do right. Uh, and we've had a bunch of false starts before we uh, finally hit on doing it this way. Um, and here's what we found from this. Uh, this is just one. This is in the Journal of Educational Psychology. Uh, Mark McDaniel was first author on this paper. This is an eighth grade science class. And so these are concepts that are quiz. And so on the chapter exams, uh, the non-quiz items were about 74%, and the teacher told us, look, when I usually give quizzes and tests in class, people get 75% right. So, for our, so that's just her standard material. That's just what she normally does. The people who had three little quizzes, they had to retrieve the information, uh, click the answer, 
for those items, they shot up to 91%. So they went from what would be a B minus in the class to an A on that set of material. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're doing this with Lynn's student, so we can't lift the whole class that high, although we're trying that now. Can we, if we do this for every item, can we get the students way up there? Um, end of the semester, we still see the effect. They do show forgetting, but we still see a testing effect or a retrieval practice effect. And in this experiment, the reason I like to present this slide is one of the few experiments. Uh, this was a, a, a science class that was done in the fall. And then in the spring, totally unexpectedly to the students, we gave them a quiz on the first material work. This didn't count for grades. This was just the teacher gave us time in class to quiz over the first semester. So this is just the residual, what remained. And uh, you see they still show this retrieval practice effect even at the end of the school year, uh, much, much uh, later. So yes, this does seem to work in the classroom. I could tell you about 10 other experiments like this, um, but won't. Um, but just to show, yes, we could translate into actual educational practice and get uh, fairly nice sized effects. We have a couple other papers on this uh, published now in uh, three or four items in your works. Now, I've, only, uh, I've written a chapter with uh, two students of mine, uh, Adam Putnam and Megan Smith, called 10 Benefits of Testing. And I'm not going, you'll be happy to know walking through all of these. But all I've talked about today is what I call number one, the testing effect of retrieval aids later retention. But there are actually, I think, a whole lot of other reasons uh, that we forget, certainly in higher education. Actually, it's easier when I give this uh, talk like this to elementary school teachers because they all have you know, the spelling quizzes on Friday every week. Well, one thing testing does that we forget about in higher education is it encourages students to study. If you give a midterm and a final, you can guarantee students will really be concentrating on studying two times, right before the midterm and right before the final. But if you do what I and some of my colleagues are doing now, if you give a quiz every class, you get students studying all during the semester. So I've gotten so, I'm a jerk when it starts out. Students can't believe in college I'm going to give them a quiz every class like they're in second grade, but I am. I'm going to give them a quiz every class. Uh, and so what Kathleen McDermott and Mark McDaniel and I have started doing in our uh, undergraduate classes and graduate classes, I have people write essays uh, every class. Um, the idea is uh, kind of like testing. Make yourself, intellect it's not nothing really about testing. It's really making yourself intellectually grapple with, reorganize in your own terms, and then produce something that helps you learn. Um, but um, say Kathleen McGarrett teaches an undergraduate course at Washington University, and uh, every day the students are supposed to do the reading, they're supposed to come to class, they're supposed to listen, and the last 10 minutes of every class is taking a quiz over the reading of what she said in class. So besides the direct benefit of retrieval, well, you also get students to A, come to class, B, participate, uh, ask questions that they don't of things they don't understand, and do the readings. Uh, testing also gives them feedback to instructors. If you don't test people much, you can have the illusion they're really understanding everything you say. I should give you all a test now. Um, but if you give them tests and you see gaps in their knowledge, you can go back and recover. Uh, same thing for students. Testing identifies gaps in students' knowledge. So the way students use flashcards really does have a good feature to it. You should study what you don't know more than you study what you know. But you should keep retrieving both of them. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this. Uh, but just to say, I think there are other reasons that we should have more frequent quizzing than we do, um, both from the teacher's point of view and from the student's point of view. That the basic idea is that retrieval practice is a great study technique to show you really to really know the material. So the recommendation from this line of work is that students should not just reread their material over and over, which is what even some of the best students do. They should uh, create ways to practice retrieval. Ask the right questions as you're studying the material, and then go back and read your questions later. Or actually use for once those questions at the end of the chapter, or those key terms at the end of the chapter. If you can't use conditioned stimulus in a sentence, after reading the chapter, you should go back and figure out what a condition stimulus is uh, for studying animal learning. 
The other thing about retrieval I haven't gone into today, we've done a whole lot of work on spacing of retrievals. It's not good to just retrieve something over and over immediately. You need to space it out in time. That helps. Uh, for teachers, uh, I encourage more constant assessment, even in university classrooms. And again, it doesn't have to be a little Mickey Mouse quiz. It can be assigning an essay or a thought question. Uh, uh, or Wes was telling me this morning about a questioning technique that he was just reading about the right question. Is that what it's called? It's here. Oh, there you are. Yeah, and where you get the students to generate questions while they're reading and then bring, talk about them to each other in class. Sounds like a great technique to me. I'm glad we have the conversation this morning. I'll probably try that. Um, we've done applied research in middle school classrooms I told you a bit about. We've also been doing using the university as a classroom and doing true experiments in there. Uh, there's positive results from InfoSight. Keith Lyle at the University of Louisville has an interesting paper on how quizzing improves statistics performance. Uh, there's another psychobiology, online psychobiology course where quizzing was effective. And I have a colleague at Washington University named uh, Doug Larson who's publishing papers applying this kind of framework to medical education and showing that if you get the medical students not just to read about it, but to practice it, mentally practice it, or even physically practice it in the case of simulations, uh, they do much better later. Um, this research was supported by uh, uh, mostly the first two organizations here. I have a third project related by, funded by a different one. And so I uh, finish now. Thank you for your uh, patience and uh, I'll be happy to answer a few questions. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think looking at this data and listening to what you say, I would have a very different hypothesis. Rather okay. than causing the students to study, maybe it's just hard thinking causes more synapses. That's fine. Right, so anything I do to think hard, like when you said writing the questions or yeah. writing essays, so it's not so much getting them to study, but to think hard about the material. Well, having okay, um, you can do. I mean, there is the big issue about how much effort is it. This all due to retrieval effort is one way to think. Right, so thinking you're hard. thinking hard, trying yeah. to get the answers. So yeah. And that's why recall would produce a better effect as it usually does in recognition. You don't have to think it's hard. There's an old pickups cartoon with Lucy going into class and Linus or somebody asked her, and say, you're taking a test. You're, you're worried to know it's multiple choice. It's like having the wind at your back. So, I mean, you can just use familiarity for multiple choice. With recall, you actually have to know something to be able to produce it. But the other, I mean, if I can ask another question. So I was taught this stuff uh, a while back when I was in grad school. And, or at least, I don't know if it was tested, but this is what they said and it seemed to work for me. And I'm, I've been horrified that all my students come in and they're outlining and studying in groups and yeah. this and that. And if they've known this for 120 years, why aren't they teaching it in school so the kids learn these things? I don't know that. Now that's a really interesting question. That, well first, I got a lot of resistance to this. You're saying, oh, I understand this and I was taught this. Most people are horrified at the idea of testing, and you have, they have to be won over. But that's why I try to couch it more now in terms of uh, everybody's for active learning. Nobody is opposed to active learning. <laughs> so now it's like retrieval is part of active learning, you know, you're, uh, even if it's learning a simple fact. Uh, we also find one of the things, one of the 10 things, Andrew Butler in his dissertation uh, with me um, asked, will this knowledge transfer? One of the criticisms of this line of work is, well, you're teaching little factoids. You know, lays a scarf, but if you actually had to talk Swahili, would you really be able to produce it? And Andrew didn't ask me about foreign language vocabulary. He asked me about science facts. Could you take them, uh, learn about a concept domain, say bats and sonar, and then apply it to uh, the Navy and so on? And he found the retrieval practice what it does is help you bring things to mind more easily, and you can then transfer them more easily. You're not just creating, uh, uh, what do what you do or call it in my, one of my papers, that, uh, isolated, uh, lifeless factoids. I think they said that's what I was doing. Uh, but you're actually able to take these, uh, the information you're retrieving, and then apply it in a new context, too, because it comes to mind more easily. 
you're practicing bringing things to mind more easily, which really is what you want learning to be. Not just to be able to passively recognize this on a multiple choice test, but to actually use it when you need it. So that's the defense. I have to, um, if I seem defensive, it's because I've been attacked a lot from this line of work, which is why I tried to frame it a slightly different way. Uh, but some of these papers were very hard to get published because they were going against what, uh, and, and the whole idea, well, aren't we better putting learning in students' hands? No, we're, we're not. Uh, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, uh, brand new physics. A brand new physics student doesn't know what she doesn't know. Uh, famous novel, wonderful book, The Unknown Knowns. And the, uh, so it's very um, it's tricky, but I totally agree with you. Anything you can do to make thinking harder, learning good, that's like the idea of desirable difficulties. But when you look at military training, Bobby Orchard has worked with military trainers, they always look at what brings people up to speed fastest. And then if you ask, well, do they know it six months later? And by the looks at you're like, yes, they learn it faster. Because you always think whatever's good for learning should be good for long-term retention, too. I mean, I would have believed that, too, 20 years ago. Yes? So I'm trying to digest everything I, I just learned, but if I understood you, then you're, what your research is showing is our educational system needs to be turned on its head. Because what we're doing is we're always testing very quickly after having learned as a as a final test. Not as a quiz, but as a final test. Right. So to make your I mean, your first research sort of show that for that effort, it is better to, to cram and, and to and study. So. <laughs> to cram and study. Why so doing. the way it, we're, yeah. we're test the way we evaluate now, it yeah. is better to cram and study, not to test. Yeah. But for long-term retention, it's much better to test. Right. But we don't test for it. So the ideal would be then, you take a course for a year, and you don't test for until the next year is over. It's the final spot. year, the yeah. year passes. Then you will have shown long-term retention. But no one cares about it. I mean, what well, do you mean? Part of my exam, 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 if you're taking the final exam, exam right. I mean, yeah. this is, I mean, you need to actually know something in future yes. courses. That's true, but not in our classes. But not no, all the classes, not many classes do that. I mean, there are all these national, I mean, universities are now being asked to de defend what we do. How do we know we're really adding value? So students who go to Harvard are really smart when they show up, and they're really smart when they leave. They could have probably gone anywhere and done. <laughs> so, I mean, I think you're raising a great question. Joshua Floor, uh, the guy who wrote Moonwalking with Einstein, he won memory championship. He called me up a while back and says, I'm looking for information that shows that people really remember stuff they learned in college. Could you point me to the evidence? Somebody suggested your name. I said, no, I can't because there's absolutely no evidence. I just want to add one thing that in other countries, the, the system is quite different. And in fact, I talked to foresters that come to America, and they're like, what is with all of these insane, you know, studying and homework and yeah. And midterms and on and on. We just did one exam at the end of the year. And yeah. that's it. Yeah. And that's often the case in most many foreign countries for England and, and France. Yeah. And high school high school you pass high school after taking one exam at the end of four years. That's how you pass high school. Yeah. You don't get lots of you get grades, but yeah. that's how you pass. Yeah. So I'm just curious if maybe they got it right. They're doing something closer that could well, you're at least studying for the long term. Yeah. You've got to know this stuff. So I think that's good. I think they do better if they also quiz along the way. Yeah. I mean, I now give, I, some years, I didn't used to, I was into a psych give cumulative final exams, and because the, the other section didn't. You know, if I gave cumulative final, but now I do, I just say the heck with it. You're in my course, you have a cumulative final, sorry. Uh, uh, because I think that's the way to go, that you really need people to review and to want to know from the long term, if you think you know, they're going to need to know someday, you know, I tell them, okay, operative conditioning doesn't seem like it's that great a topic. I say, someday you'll own a dog or you'll have a child, and operative conditioning will seem like the greatest thing in the world. So you don't recognize you're going to need all this stuff when you're being taught it, but much later, uh, some of the stuff will really be useful, especially in intro science. Uh, but, but I agree with you. I mean, the way we do things, 
Uh, and we can't justify, I mean, Congress is asking universities to justify what they do. And what do we say? I mean, do we give people like a quota of the SAT when they get out? It used to be at least, you know, most universities had like a core curriculum. And now we've mostly, in, in the United States, gone away from that, right? except for the University of Chicago and Columbia and places like that. Now we kind of have a smorgasbord board of courses, so you need to satisfy a science requirement, but you can do it in physics or earth and planetary sciences or in some university in psychology, but you don't have to know any particular science, you just have to have been exposed to science. And, you know, the old course curriculum, I can see that was too structured, the idea that your freshman year, I mean, my freshman year, all freshmen took five courses and we all took the same five courses by and large. Uh, there were a few exceptions, but everybody took Western civilization. You had to do that, a whole year of Western civilization. And so the students complained about it, but you know, at least had a course <laughs> where you could converse with other people about something. Uh, whereas if I'm taking physics and you're taking biology, we talk about sports and we have dinner. <laughs> uh, one of the big complaints I hear at universities when I go around, I work, have a part-time job in the provost's office at Washington University, and it's that uh, the claim is, and I'm, it's untestable, but that students, when they're on their own in the dorms or just having dinner, they don't have intellectual conversations like they used to in the old days. <laughs> well, I was there in the old days. I'm not sure that's really true. <laughs> <laughs> but to the extent that it is, one thing I always point out, well, in the past, we were taking common subjects. We all took freshman English. We were all reading the same things and complaining about them. But at least we're reading the same things that we could talk about. Them. But if we're all doing different things, if you're taking Japanese poetry for your English or your literature requirement, and I'm taking German literature, well, you know, when we sit down, we don't have common uh, ground to talk about. So I think that what could be one reason, if it is even true that, uh, I'm not sure it ever was true that students were sitting around talking about great ideas at night, but to me it was, was true. It would be harder to do that because everybody's taking such different things. So I think it's a, going away from the common core curriculum, or at least having a few courses everybody took, but also going away from common ground. That's way off the top of it. So, so I, I have a, a question about one of the earlier studies you brought up. I'm trying to use my memory to remember which one it was. It was a, it was a dropout, no dropout condition yep. two weeks after, and the dropout had 21% performance. That right. slide makes sense. Yep. So, referencing that slide, did you have a dependent measure where you could look at the 21% of the terms they would be called and break it down by were the things they remembered early dropout, late dropout, or no dropout terms? Or did you Ooh, that's that a very good question. Um, I can't really remember if we did that or not, but it's not a good thing to so get into it. I can't remember if it's in the paper. We did look at, in that same experiment, a number of retrievals, or maybe it wasn't the same one. One of the Carpicky ones, and Jeff has done a lot of work on this since he's left working with me, so he might have done it since then. That's a very good question. Um, my guess is the early ones uh, are the really, really easy items that you might hang on. I mean, there might just be, like, imagine cognates in a foreign language. Uh, that those are just so easy, you don't have to practice them much. So it might be the later ones you just barely get, but then it's gone two weeks later. Or a week later. Doesn't that, that go against your prediction, right? Because you're getting tested less on the early dropouts. So. Right, but they might. You just have item differences too. There are just yeah, some so things that are really hard, yeah. uh, and so you know those really hard things, even after lots of retrieval practice, you might have trouble. One more question I probably should wind it up. Do you think there's any uh, validity in looking at the difference between <coughs> a study test cycle that's done, uh, let's call it annually, you know, paper and pencil versus a study test cycle that's done completely online or using computer media? I don't know of any evidence like that. I can tell you one thing we just did in the paper and press. Uh, I was always wondering how much of this my gut reaction was that part of this was being really active and saying things. So we asked, you know, say something out loud. So if I see the like laser scarf, so if I see laser and I have to produce scarf, am I better to write scarf? Am I better to say it out loud? Or is it enough? I just look at laser and I, you don't ask me to produce it all, I just make a checkbox if I think I know it. And people are actually pretty accurate at that. Um, and the answer is it doesn't matter. As long as you actively retrieve it, you don't have to overtly produce it. My suspicion is online is just as good as paper. Uh, 
a lot of online learning strategies, I go to websites, and there's lots of them claiming use space retrieval. Uh, I mean, based on our work and other people's work, we use, uh, so they try to build them into their program. So you're, just as you're about to forget something, you should be tested on it again, and then restudy it if you don't know it. That'll give you the most bang for the buck. So my guess is the online stuff will be fine for this purpose. 